Welcome to the record. I'm Mark Maxwell. All is quiet on Capitol Hill these days. Members of the House and Senate are out on summer break, but preparing to return to action after the Labor Day weekend. The U.S. Senate returns to action this next week, and there's a showdown brewing there. The Pentagon says more than 300 generals and admirals can't take their posts, while a lone senator blocks their confirmation. Alabama Senator Tommy Tuberville is protesting their appointments because he says the Pentagon should not reimburse members of the military for traveling to receive abortion services. Tuberville says he's not opposed to these appointments in particular. He just wants senators to vote on that abortion policy in the military. Joining us now is Democratic candidate uh, Lucas Kuntz running for the U.S. Senate in 2024. In a primary now, you hope to take on Josh Hawley uh, next November. Why not just take up that vote? Should Senate Democrats call Tuberville's bluff? I mean, this is another situation where these guys, uh, you know, Tommy Tuberville and others in the past, have used service members, veterans, et cetera, for political leverage to, to you know, really work entirely other issues. And so I, I think the frustrating thing for me as a veteran, so I was a Marine for 13 years, deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, just last year when the Senate had the opportunity to pass the PACT Act, so I don't know if you know what the PACT Act is, but it was an act to take care of all of us in Iraq and Afghanistan who were exposed to burn pits, uh, Republicans like Josh Hawley voted against it. And uh, Josh Hawley, um, you know, what Tuberville is doing right now is he was holding up DOD nominations. Josh Hawley actually did the same thing uh, until he was removed from the Senate Armed Services Committee and Tuberville took his place. And now Tuberville is doing it uh, for different reasons. But I mean, for the first time in history, my Marine Corps doesn't have a commandant, which is amazing. For the first time in more than a century. Right, in more, in more than a century, that's right. In my lifetime, we certainly haven't. And yeah, it's since the early 1900s. And so it's, uh, and actually so do a bunch of the other services don't have leaders. And so- well, Soon Mark Milley's on his way out. But, that's right. So, so just on the military readiness side though, is it really having an impact? Because they're still acting, they're just not Senate confirmed. What's the difference? Yeah, well, I'm glad you asked that. And so for each person that leaves, so it's over 300 generals uh, and flag officers now have not been replaced. And so when someone gets promoted, they're taking someone else's spot, right? And so all these members uh, are retiring, and the people who are supposed to be promoted and take their positions aren't able to get promoted and take their positions. So you have like a cascade effect all the way down, way down the chain of command where one person has to move up, and then the next people have to try to move up. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it really just, you have people who can't do their entire jobs anymore. And we also have, well, well, just one more thing. You know, I used to do national security negotiations mm -hmm. um, over with NATO, uh, the Organization for Security Cooperation in Europe and others. And uh, I'm telling you right now, like rank matters at these organizations. We would send the highest ranking officers we could uh, to show that the U.S. cared about certain positions. And now for a lot of the people who would be doing international negotiations, particularly with China or Russia across from the table, like we're going to be sending much lower ranked officers and it's going to make it look to our allies, partners in other countries like we just don't care about this thing. How, how do you sum up for the people watching from afar saying, well, what's the real impact to me? How, how is the average American voter uh, affected? here you are less secure because of this our That's national not an exaggeration no it's not our national security is weaker when our country does negotiations overseas we are now at a disadvantage because we have lower ranking officers and I'm telling you right now these other countries they notice that they think we don't care and it gives our adversaries like China and Russia an advantage and the other thing about this that not everybody's talking about is this hurts military families because a lot of these families who are going to get promoted they were scheduled to move to different places to take new positions their pay raises can't kick in that's yet. right all their pay raises can't kick in but they don't even know where they can register their kids for school uh, you know, they're stuck in this limbo where, you know, we do as many moves as we can over the summer in the military to not mess with kids' education. Mm -hmm. And now you're going to have all these kids who, if this does happen, you know, two months into the school year, they're not going to have to go to another place. Spouses who have employment, you know, maybe they had employment lined up at the new duty station and now that's going to fall through because sure. they, you know, they're not going to be there on time. You're, you're rattling, off, rattling off a list of things, reasons why the Senate really hasn't touched this before, has, hasn't used this as a bargaining chip before. Now Tommy Tuberville is doing so for the reason that he is among a select number of Republicans that are more aggressive on the abortion policy question. So again, I, I just, the Senate procedure can get a little wonky, but the Senate does have a path forward here. If Majority Leader Schumer decides to say, hey, you know what, we're going to call his bluff, we're going to take a vote on the issue about whether or not members of the military can travel for this, just put the votes on the board, the Democrats could basically railroad him and make this a moot issue. Why not do that? Well, that's, first of all, that's if you believe him, right? And I'm not sure that these people have proven themselves to be trustworthy. Like, Tuberville, you mean. Right, exactly. I mean, I mean, 
the guy wants to use military officers, who are non-political, by the way. These aren't even political appointees as pawns. And so who's to say he's not going to use it for the next thing? Like, I think it would be a very bad precedent to say, okay, senators, every single one of you can now hold up non-political appointees, essentially act as terrorists, right? Like, we are now going to negotiate with terrorists uh, every single time that they decide to do this. And, uh, and they can all get their way just by one person being a jerk about something. I don't think that's the type of thing that we should let happen. If that word terrorist sounds like extreme rhetoric, John Boehner, former House Republican Speaker, used that word, legislative terrorist, to describe Ted Cruz and others in recent uh, memory. Uh, all right, let's move on to some other issues recently. I know oncologists in part of Missouri can't get their hands on enough generic cancer drugs to treat patients they had before them, in part because the drug makers say they see diminishing returns in profits. There's not enough profit out there to make so they're making fewer drugs. Uh, you've said you're going to change the incentive structure for these drug makers uh, if they don't make enough of an essential drug. But don't you start to run the risk of messing with U.S. patent law? Uh, how do you change the incentive structure for drug makers? Well, actually, a lot of these drugs are generics. I mean, you're not running into patent issues with these drugs. And so what it is is they've offshored a bunch of their production capacity because they didn't want to make it here anymore. And, uh, it's and cheaper to make it there because labor is cheaper there. Right. They're, they are using uh, labor arbitrage, right? They say, we don't want to pay the American worker. We want to move this stuff overseas. And, and even so, some of that's artificial, right? Like countries like China and India, they use subsidies and they use economic incentives to bring manufacturing over there uh, so that it looks cheaper at the beginning. And then they're able to capture that capacity. It helps them domestically because then they have it manufactured domestically, creates jobs and things like that. And so, you know, if they're going to play that game, then we should play that game, too. Like, we should invest in creating generics here. I mean, I believe that there's more than just cost when it comes to taking care of American families. Like, this shouldn't be about profit. This should be taking care of American families. It should be making sure that cancer patients have the drugs that they need. You know, there was a story the other day where a doctor told his patient that normally you would have an 88% chance of survival, it was something like that, 88, 85, but because we can't get that drug, it's going to be more like 44 or 45. And so, you know, what I want to do is whenever, whenever the market's not working, whenever monopolists or massive corporations have too much power, I believe that we need to change the incentives or we need to get into the market and shake things up a little bit. And, uh, and so, you know, one of the things that I've seen in this market right now is that, um, you know, a massive percentage of our domestic drug manufacturing capacity just isn't being used at all. It's just absolutely dormant. And so the federal government should step in, kickstart that, get it started, and create competition in the marketplace. Uh, would you support single payer? Uh, well, I mean, I think we need to do whatever we can. So that's, that's kind of a... That's another side, right? Like that's the demand side. That's well, the that's jumping to the end game. It's right, like, exactly. We're gonna, we're gonna and so, so that's aside from production. That's negotiating. Yeah, I mean, what we need to do is we need to negotiate drug prices too. And so that's uh, that's getting into something else. I mean, we've seen Medicare negotiations finally starting right now uh, with drug prices. But um, but pharmaceutical companies. I didn't get an answer out of you though. Would you support single payer? I would support anything that brings us to being able to negotiate uh, with these drug so you're companies. Open to single payer. I'm open to it. Yeah, I'm. There are a lot of ways, man, and I think we need to start pursuing as many as we can. Is one of those ways voting for the Inflation Reduction Act? Would you have voted for that? Yes, I would have been voted. I mean, that would have brought the Inflation Reduction Act voted to reshore manufacturing, to invest in pharmaceuticals here again, to start building out the next generation of energy here. That was an investment in America. It was an investment in the American people, and it was an investment in the future of jobs here in Missouri. And it added a tool to the Biden administration or to the White House's that, toolbox. That's right, they to negotiate, negotiate drug prices. With Medicare. Mm -hmm. not with, so if right. you're on Medicaid or if you're in a, a private health insurance plan, this wouldn't really affect you yet. But uh, seniors on Medicare, you might see lower drug prices because the White House can start to whittle away at those most expensive or most commonly used drugs. What did you make of that announcement just uh, this week from the Biden administration? I think we absolutely need, need to do this. I mean, we need to go. What? It is absolutely crazy to me that you wouldn't negotiate prices and then you would just say whoever's giving you the stuff can just name the price. And the sad thing is that uh, we kind of saw that in the Pentagon when I worked there. So my last tour of duty at the Pentagon, I was in acquisitions, and I remember we were trying to buy a new aircraft for a treaty called the Open Skies Treaty. And I go to these requirement meetings where, so when you buy a new aircraft, like all these people at the Pentagon get together, they have to, you have to do like two years of writing out every single thing that the aircraft needs, you know, every, down to every little nut and bolt. And so everybody in these rooms was so frustrated. They were like, I don't know why we're doing this, because once you get that, once you've written it all out, you put it out for bids, mm -hmm. and then everybody bids on it. And everybody was like, I don't know why we're doing this. There's only one company that can make the aircraft. There's only one that can make the communication suite. Like, this is pointless. We're just going to put it out. Uh, it's going to be a sole source contract. They're going to charge us whatever they want to charge us. They're never going to get it to us on time. 
That's what happens when you have a non-competitive economy. That's what happens when you can't negotiate. That's why I think some people are worried about a single-payer system. And, well, and the reason to, to not negotiate in Medicare was like just absolutely crazy not to do that. Uh, interesting. Let's move on to another topic because I think there's a lot of different things we'd love to, to hear from you. Uh, mm -hmm. St. Louis Mayor Tashara Jones recently proposed an idea that she wants to ban the uh, uh, possession or carrying of uh, assault-style rifles, AR-15s and the like, in the city of St. Louis, and wants to ban uh, anyone who is convicted of uh, insurrection or of storming the Capitol on January 6th or of a hate crime of owning guns at all. What do you think of ideas like that? You know, I think we need to brainstorm as many ideas as we can on gun violence right now. Uh, it's getting out of control. I think, you know, uh, people in St. Louis should be able to figure out what they need to do in St. Louis. Um, for me, you know, statewide and nationwide, I think it's absolutely crazy that we haven't been able to do the things that just a massive majority of people, including Missourians, want to do. I mean, we haven't even done red flag protections, decent background checks, or an age limit in training that goes with weapons. Like, like, how have we not done that, man? It's like over 80% of Americans and, and Missourians want those things. And, uh, and so, no, you know, as a U.S. senator, my job is not to get into St. Louis's business, but these, those are the types of things that I would want to do at the federal level that I think are absolutely critical. Former U.S. Senator, former Missouri Senator Roy Blunt did vote to expand federal funding incentives for red flag laws, but states have to pick that money up off the table and implement the policies. Missouri has opted not to do so. Uh, would you take a step farther and, and require them at the federal level, or how would you approach it? Oh, yeah, we just need to do it that way. We need to make it happen. I mean, it's about people keeping people safe. It's about making sure that we have responsible gun ownership and that... Um, and to people, gun owners, who say that they feel that their due process rights are trampled or ignored or sort of railroaded in that process, in the red flag process, where their flag, their gun is taken, and then they have to go to court later to kind of prove to get it back? Are you okay? How do you see that issue? Oh, we haven't seen that yet happen yet. Let's start. Let's start taking the steps we need to take uh, and see where it plays out. I think we're all reasonable and we can all figure out a way that makes this work, that makes sense, because what we have right now doesn't make sense at all. We saw you at the Missouri State Fair just last week. We That's also a good saw, party. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and we saw Josh Hawley there. After mm -hmm. we spoke to you, Senator Hawley uh, basically compared President Trump's efforts to influence Georgia election officials. He compared that to uh, an official recount process. What do you make of that comparison from Senator Hawley? Uh, you know, look, Senator Hawley is like, He's a fake, he's a fraud, he's buying in on everything Trump that he can because he thinks it's his path to victory. The guy only cares about power for himself. And you saw that on January 6th, right? When he thought it was going to get him some power, he's out there pumping his fist and citing a crowd, and then the second things get real, he's skittering out the back door and running away. And so, like, I'm not surprised by anything this guy does. For me, when I look at the process of what anybody is going through in the criminal justice system, like, as someone who's been a part of the criminal justice system in the Marine Corps, like I say, let the investigation play out, let the courts play out, and just make sure, like, the most important thing to me is the integrity of the judicial process and making sure that we don't have a two-tiered justice system, because I'm tired of people at the top mm -hmm. getting away with things where everybody else gets in trouble. That was the line you used at the State Fair, too. You said you didn't want to see a two-tiered system of justice, but Republicans have used, and I understood you to mean uh, you didn't want to see two-tiered between people in power and those out of power. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, Republicans have said there's a two-tiered system of justice between people like Donald Trump and people like Joe Biden, or people like Donald Trump and people like Hillary Clinton. So can you be more specific? Have you seen enough evidence that you think Donald Trump should be convicted? Again, I think it should play out, and he should go through the courts, and if he committed the crime, he should do the time, right? Isn't that the rhyme? And so that's how it should be for everybody. It really is. It's how it should be for everybody, whether you're a Democrat, you're a Republican, uh, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you're a CEO, whether you're a worker, and it's just not that way right now. You hope to be on the ballot in November of 2024 alongside two candidates or more running for president of the United States. Is Joe Biden the man for the job in 24? You know, I'm just focused on my campaign. I'm getting all around Missouri, meeting Missourians. Um, I have unique issues that I care about. I'm working hard. I'm building a coalition right now. We'll let the voters decide that. Uh, but for me, uh, I know I'm the right guy for Missouri, and I'm happy to be out there meeting people every single day. But what does it say if you can? I, I want to make sure I'm hearing you correctly. I didn't hear you just give, offer a full-throated endorsement. Do you think there's somebody else out there in the Democratic Party that could run a primary that would give the country a better alternative? Yeah, I guess I, I guess the best answer is like I'm not thinking about the presidential race. I don't know, you know. Well, I sure got, you are. I got. A, I'm not, man. I got a new baby at home. Uh, I got who's been in the NICU for eight weeks. You know, we're trying to take care of our family, a new family. I'm trying to get out of this around the state and meet as many people as I can, as many people as possible. And for me, I don't. I don't think the top of the ticket's going to matter. Like for me, it's about Missouri. It's about investing here. It's about my state. It's about my race. And 100% uh, and of my energy is dedicated toward that. But you have to have an opinion on the president of the United States. You're running for the U.S. Senate. Has Joe Biden earned a second term? Well, I'm glad he's negotiating Medicare prices. That's good. So you're looking at his record. 
do you want to see him on the ballot alongside your name in 2024? Again, like, I don't care. I don't care who's on the ballot alongside me in 2024. Like, I'm happy to run with anybody. So I think he's going to be the pick. It sure looks that way to me. But, okay. but that's not like a... It's not like a, I don't think that that's a negative or a positive for me. So I think we can't I, think I can just run on myself. I see. I hear you. So you're sidestepping the question, but we shouldn't put you among those Democrats who are becoming more vocal, saying they want to see somebody challenge him in a primary. No, I don't care. I don't. I like again. I don't care if he's challenged or not challenged. Like I think he'd be fine on the ticket, and uh, and I'm just going to focus on my race. All right, we'll leave it there. A lot okay. more in this race to come, especially alongside uh, Senator Carla May and also Prosecutor Wesley Bell, who are running in this primary against Lucas Coons. Thanks for joining us. Okay. Thanks. Five on your side, political analyst Anita Mannion is now here with the reaction and analysis for the record. What do you think? Does he really not care if Joe Biden is on the top of the ticket in 2024? Has he really not thought about it? <laughs> I, I think he does care. Of course he cares. The top of the ticket matters for who shows out, what voter enthusiasm is, and who's potentially going to vote for him. He sort of sidestepped the question about guns in St. Louis. Uh, is that a, w I mean, what did you make of his response to that question, trying to win in a statewide election? Well, he said St. Louis voters should decide for themselves. And if you're winning a Democratic primary, you have to win St. Louis. So he doesn't want to alienate those voters. Some of our viewers may have seen that President Biden offered a speedy recovery to Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell this week after the Kentucky Republican froze up for 30 seconds and was unable to speak during a press conference. That's the second incident we've seen like this in about a month's time. Right. You throw in the health complications from Senator Dianne Feinstein. Uh, you've also seen President Biden have a share of stumbles on the stairs or behind the mic as well. And it just seems that there's a lot of frailty in positions of power in the country right now. How much of an impact do you think those collective concerns weigh on the minds of voters heading into this big election year? I think voters definitely care. We see the polling about the presidential race. People are not excited for a Biden-Trump rematch. And part of the reason is the age. That seems to be the biggest concern with Biden. When Pelosi stepped down and her leadership team stepped down in the House, they decreased their average age by 30 years. So it will be interesting to see if something similar would happen with McConnell in the Senate. Just so that sinks in, that's a stunning thought. The average age of the individual person in a position of leadership in the House reduced by it three from, decades? It went from early 80s to early 50s. So that is a huge shift. And, you know, with McConnell, he's not up for re-election till November 2026. His term goes till January 2027. So we have to wait and see what happens there. And if he's, if, if for some reason he has to vacate the office, what, what then? So the Republicans in Kentucky made it so the governor does not make that appointment. And a Democratic governor. That's correct. There's a Democratic governor, but a Republican state legislature. So they made it so there's a committee of people in his own party who would choose his replacement. A little power play there uh, That's right. in Kentucky. Closer to home, there are some new developments in the push to put an abortion question on the ballot in Missouri next fall. This series of questions could ask voters to relax restrictions on abortion in cases of rape, incest, or the life and health of the mother. Some of that language also suggests that uh, it might allow abortion procedures in the first 12 months of pregnancy, a much more moderate position than the current outright ban, but right. still not nearly as permissive as many pro-choice advocates would like to see. Could a question framed like that loosely provide something of political cover to Republicans running in a statewide race in Missouri? Well, one of the folks putting this forward was, is a Republican, and so there, I'm sure there's some strategy there. The polling nationwide and in Missouri shows that people don't support this total outright ban. And it's not just people who are seeking abortions that have questions about it. It's expectant mothers who are worried about complications in their pregnancy. So this might provide cover. I think seeing what Attorney General Ashcroft does with this round of initiative petitions mm. might give us some insight into how Republicans might think about it. He and Attorney General Bailey have really tried to stand in opposition to the question that would just basically legal, bring back full legal access to abortion statewide. Right. Will they take a different posture in this question? Interesting to watch. How do you think the, uh, this more moderate version, we'll call it that, uh, question would impact turnout? Or would we see more Republicans at the ballot, more Democrats? I think that the abortion issue being on the ballot, based on what we've seen in other states, is likely to bring out younger voters, um, female voters, maybe more liberal voters. People tend to turn out when something's being taken away from them. So the uh, pro-life side was previously energized, but now we see the pro-choice side really energized. Interesting. And you don't often see presidential candidates come through the show me state, especially since we're not an early voting state. We've shifted down in the calendar and from a primary to a caucus in 2024. Yet still, 
Vivek Ramaswamy uh, was canceled at an event he was trying to host in Webster Groves at Olive and Oak, instead shifting over to the Four Seasons this week. Uh, it, it was interesting there. He kind of picked a fight. His campaign picked a fight with the place, saying, "Oh, they canceled me for my political beliefs." It seems like there's this certain line of thinking emerging in some uh, uh, political circles that any press is good press. If you get attention, do it. Uh, if you can get canceled by the right group, then you're going to get in with your group uh, of people. Uh, what do you make of his sort of style and approach in this primary? Very reminiscent of another presidential candidate, right? So it's sort of that Trump, you like to be a fighter, you like to be canceled. And I think that he's thriving on this. He, uh, and he's certainly fundraising off of it. So from the president, yeah, he, he is. Um, and we'll see, uh, he didn't have time to stop in with us. We tried to get an interview. Perhaps there will be one in the future. And hey, if you're ready for president, come through St. Louis. There's <laughs> Illinois and Missouri. We're down in the calendar a ways, but we want to talk to those candidates as well. All right, let's get a lot closer to home from presidential politics to St. Louis City. Uh, people that have been around for a while that have grown frustrated with the, the lethargy in government, the red tape in bureaucracy, they have their eyes on this charter commission. The mayor and uh, the board of aldermen president, Megan Green, really kind of muscled this through. Voters approved it. They met for the first time last night. Any changes would still be a long way off. If they completely remake the city's founding documents, that wouldn't happen until after voters got a good look at it and still approved it. But how closely are you watching this group's work? Well, I think it's interesting and, you know, they could take a lot of different approaches. They could do very minor changes, things like changing the language and updating some of those really outdated rules. But they could also take some really broad strokes and um, really remake the city of St. Louis and how it functions. We know that the mayor got appointees that she wanted. They had to be approved by the Board of Aldermen, but at least five of the nine contributed to Mayor Tashara Jones' campaign. Um, some have publicly endorsed her when she was running. So uh, presumably this will be a favorable group for the mayor, but ultimately it's gonna be up to the voters to approve whatever they do. We're just getting our first look at some opposition to the creation of this commission. There's a, uh, a in its early days, a lawsuit filed um, by some attorneys and judges and folks who say the creation of this commission is illegal. They still say the city's outdated. They don't like the weak mayor system. It seems like they're in alignment with some of the pursuits of this push, but they say the process is flawed. Do you have any read on their angle, why they'd want to throw a wrench in the works to this? You know, I, I'm curious about what their motivations are because I haven't heard them explicitly say this is something that should be done or shouldn't be done or they have a particular problem with it. Um, sometimes people just want to gum up the works and if they think this is a commission that might be favorable to Mayor Jones and that's not someone they like or that they particularly want to support, you know, stymieing her efforts might be part of their motivation. A political play. That's right. Fighting out in the court. We've never seen that in Missouri Oh, gosh, before. no. <laughs> uh, a dash of sarcasm there to close out. Anita Mannion, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. And we'll be back at the same time next week. Until then, we're off the record.